Well, let me welcome all of you. So today we have this uh, Wednesday seminar on a very current and topical subject, you know, mapping each other's interest in Kashmir. Come. Uh, and we have with us uh, to give this talk, uh, Mr. Vidyan Rich. Uh, you have his uh, bio data with him. You know, he's a researcher, analyst, and consultant interested in Asian security and India's foreign business policies. He's uh, published uh, in different you know, periodicals, newspapers, journals, and also cited, quoted often. Uh, he has worked earlier with the ORF. Uh, senior fellow in strategic studies, and today, you know, he'll be talking about uh, partly about uh, China's response to recent decision of government of India and the Parliament taking on the 5th August to you know, effectively sort of defang or abrogate Article 370, and also you know reorganize Jammu and Kashmir, including through setting up of new. Union territory of Ladakh. He will examine you know, how China has reacted, how and why China has reacted to that, and he will also look into some other you know, background issues relating to to Pakistan occupied Kashmir, China Pakistan, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, Adar Kashmir link, and uh, try to analyze uh, the Chinese uh, motives drivers behind their thinking and action on those issues. Uh, as you know, the Chinese reaction uh, over the last uh, you know, few days uh, has been uh, fairly strong. You know. First, there was a uh, statement, a uh, written comment issued by spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China, on, uh, specifically on, uh, on uh, Constitution of New Union Territory of Ladakh and they are also on Article 370 and related developments. Uh, this matter also was a major preoccupation during uh, discussions uh, Minister of External Affairs Dr. S. Yashankar had in Beijing with his counterpart, State Councillor and Foreign Minister Mangi on 12th August. Uh, many of you would have seen uh, press release issued by Ministry of External Affairs on those discussions as also speech made by the Minister at the fourth uh, India China High Level Media Forum which was convened in Beijing at the same time. In that, in those you know, two statements, uh, uh, in some detail, uh, it has been brought out how these issues figured in Minister's uh, discussions with uh, uh, his counterpart in particular. Without uh, further ado, I'll request uh, Abhijan to make his presentation. It will take about 40 minutes. About 40 minutes, and then we'll have a floor open for discussion. Thank you, Ambassador Kantar, for that introduction. What I'll do today is a couple of things. So first, I'll look at the history of India-China dispute, and especially when it comes to Aksai Chin. It's going to be a very ambitious thing because I'm going to cover a period from 9th March 1846 to 12th August 2019. So it's a long history. Um, but the reason I'm going to do that, I mean, this is independent of the rest of the talk, because I think a lot of us need to know with some degree of, with some degree of care what the history is, right? But then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to look at what I call strategies of linkages in China's behavior. So these are the two, two things that I want to accomplish. Uh, disclaimer, the maps here uh, are not endorsed by government of India and not endorsed by me. So just for representation purposes. So what is the context? The context we all know. Effective abrogation of Article 370 of the Constitution and the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act of 2019. What happened there? We all know the story so quickly. Union territories of Jammu and Kashmir with legislature and Ladakh without legislature created from the erstwhile state 
of Jammu and Kashmir on August 9, 2019, when the President signed the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Bill. Ladakh Union Territory to now include Kargil, right? So, but this one, no. Now, what happens here is something very interesting, and this is a starting point. So, on 6th August 2019, when there was a Lok Sabha debate, and the Home Minister has to justify or essentially convince the opposition of the reasons behind why this reorganization bill was passed, why Article 370 was effectively abrogated. I don't think it was abrogated, it was scraped. It's a legal distinction that one needs to mind. Keep in mind. But the Home Minister says something very interesting, right? And I think that provokes a very serious Chinese reaction. He says, when I say Jammu and Kashmir, it includes POK. Both Indian and JNK constitutions say that the state is an integral part of India, and this gives us the right to form laws of the state, which includes POK and Aksai Che. And he just says, right? Uh, and that, that, to my mind, was a very strong statement to, to make, which I'll explain. As Ambassador Kanta explained, MOFA reacts very strongly to this. Later that evening, well, there is a MOFA statement where the spokesperson says something like, recently India has continued to undermine China's territorial sovereignty by unilaterally changing its domestic law. That was kind of a very weird thing, because domestic law can only be changed unilaterally, right? you can't be changed bilaterally. <laughs> but, but, but nevertheless, the MOFA says that, and, but then, then the, spokes, the spokesperson says, she says, such practice is unacceptable and will not come into force again. Maybe we lost something in translation, but that's, that's exactly what, what was said. As Ambassador Kanta also pointed out, State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wai Ni during EM's visit to Beijing uh, on August 12th, uh, 2019, this issue comes up. There's another thing that happens, and I don't know how many, how many of you have noticed this. If you look at elite opinion, and that's, that's a methodology of, of study of them. If you look at elite opinion on the on the Reorganization Act, on the abrogation of effective abrogation of 370, certain very prominent commentators, uh, without naming names, they go and say, "Well, this is correcting De Delhi's colonial legacy. This is exercising Curzon's boast." I believe this was one commentator used. So, so this is now being framed in elite minds as a very large move, right, which now extends way back into India's history, uh, into relatively deep history. Why should that matter? Another thing happens. It happens about, I think, 10 days ago, give or take, where China releases a new defense white paper. Right? And for the first time, Xinjiang is taken very seriously. And we call it the East Turkmenistan, Xinjiang. We will, uh, you know, it's our territorial integrity. We take this very seriously. Do keep in mind that Aksai Chin, if you recognize Chinese <coughs> This is part of Xinjiang. It's part of the Wutong Prefecture. Right? So there are these multiple things that 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 lays on the context. Now my principal claims here are two. China has, and this is what I hope to establish in the course of my talk. China has directly pursued strategies of linkages and delinkages when it comes to the boundary issue with India. I will explain in due course what I mean by that. And that's claim one. The, claim, the second claim is that with recent developments in Jammu and Kashmir, coupled with China's own ongoing disputes elsewhere, remember the vanguard incident with Vietnam is pretty much on right now, right? That's where Hong Kong is, is on. Maybe Hong Kong will end. Maybe. India at once, now because of all of this, if you take the two together, India at once faces an opportunity as well as a threat in resolving the boundary dispute with China. And I emphasize both. There is a threat, but there is also an opportunity. And I will explain with some degree of rigor, I hope, what the opportunities are and what the threats are. Just for those of you who are not too conversant about the topography, and I think we should start there, how, where various things go. Uh, this is the, this is Aksai Chin. Essentially, keep in mind that there is the Kulun mountain. That essentially is India's claim. This is the map of India that, that we, we know and love. That's a Kulun Shan that's right. But then there is another mountain range that comes inside it, and that's the Karpura. And essentially, if I have to simplify the debate, and I won't, but this is kind of a, a starting point, if I have to simplify the debate, it has been between whether you go for Kulun or whether you go for Karpura. Because Aksai Chin. If you look again at the map, it's right, right, right there in the, in the middle. Look, a, a, lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the plane is, is, is right there. These are two maps. Again, I won't endorse maps. Uh, 
not endorsed, not endorsed by GOI, but, but, but these are uh, two Western maps. One is of the India China in the Western sector. The red is is uh, is accession for most part. Uh, and what you see there in this map is that the red represents Chinese claims, uh, Indian claims, and there is a dotted line that is the in the Chinese line of control. Right? That's 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 one dispute right there. Um, Another map, this is on the eastern sector. Again, it is the McMahon line. I think all of you know what the McMahon line is. It's our plane line on, on, on that crosses over our natural covers or Nachi or Nepa and or not, what used to be Nepa, right? And of course the pink is what the Chinese consider South China. Uh, humanly enough. Let's get started with the history. They say it's going to be long, right? So essentially where does the story start? You know, in popular imagination. Even among strategic studies scholars who are not specialists on China, I think this is a very simple matter where you know Mara Yahari Singh just signed off the Doji and Kashmir thing in October with an uh, instrument for accession and everything came there. And so, what's the fuss? Actually, there is a lot of fuss because the history is very complicated. And the history starts literally on 9th March 1846 with the Treaty of Lahore. What happens there? So, up and until that point, Jammu and Kashmir was controlled by the Lahore state. These were the Sikhs that were controlling the Lahore state. So the first Anglo-Sikh war takes place, right? The Sikhs lose. And as part of the sort of the give and take that happens with Lahore state and British India, Jammu and Kashmir is given to the British. So that's the Treaty of Lahore where Jammu and Kashmir transfers to British India. That's part one. Why is that important? That is important because a few years before that, there was a treaty between Ladakh and Tibet and Treaty of Amity between Chinese and Sikhs in 1842. And that is this kind of the starting point of, of, of a lot of these debates because, it, and I looked at the archival, archival documents and you see the language, they say, well, you know, we don't have to really worry about the boundary between Ladakh and Tibet because it has been, I quote, as fixed from ancient times, this is the Tibetan position, and in accordance to old customs, which is the JNK position. So, so, so there is, that is already said that, okay, you know, we all know where the plane lines are. These are old customs, ancient times, we just kind of move on. But then, this is the Sikhs and the Chinese, but let's see, as I said, Sikhs lose the first Anglo-Indian war, uh, and the uh, Sikh war, I'm sorry, and transfer past. <coughs> Chinese activities, who are talking about? So, so there is Ladakh and Tibet, but then there is Chinese and Sikhs. And Chinese were then touch with Sikhs. Yes. They're, they're two, two different. Two, so these two documents are in Rani's book the, as, a, as an appendix. So they're two documents, they're kind of, but they're both kind of linked to each other. So the Ladakh and Tibet one is very explicit. This is that is where the old customs ancient this the Chinese and Sikhs say as I believe the language is as formally accepted and drawing on the other documents. So these are two linked documents, but Roughly once in the document. The second step happens literally how many days? Seven days later, on 16th of March 1846, where there is the Treaty of Amritsar, right? And what happens with the Treaty of Amritsar is the Maharaja of Jammu, uh, Gulab Singh, who was the great grandfather of Hari Singh, who we all know, he buys Jammu and Kashmir from the British. It's, it's an outright sale for 75 lakh rupees, rupees in a very specific sense. Uh, and if you look at that treaty of, of Amritsar, you realize that this is an outright sale. He becomes a Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir. The, so the Dobra dynasty starts with Gulab Singh. And, but except the sovereignty is very limited sovereignty. In the sense the treaty kind of tells Gulab Singh, you can't do this, 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 and this. Right? But anyway, there is, there is a transfer there. A very interesting part about the treaty is that if you look at the Article 10 of this treaty, they say, well, you know, in exchange of uh, uh, of all this, you have to accept our supremacy, the British say. And as a sign of our supremacy, you have to send us one horse, 12 goats, and, uh, and six Kashmir shawls every year. <coughs> it's not a bad deal, right? I mean, you can do that. But anyway, more seriously, the Article 2 of the treaty talks about the eastern boundary. Because remember, it's the eastern boundary with east of Kashmir. That is what is of of contention here. And they agree that this has to be fixed by British commissioners and Gulab Singh. Not just by British commissioners. They said both British commissioners and Gulab Singh respectively. Right? So, 
get into a compound. But there are other casts of characters in, in all of this, right? There is the Hun, the princely state of Hunza. Right? So Hunza is in Gilgit Pakistan. Now, what is Hunza's relationship with JNK? It's very, very controversial. I've not been able to find a single scholarly work that settles the matter completely. My understanding of the Hunza relationship is they accepted Jammu and Kashmir, the princely state, as their sovereign authority, but had a great deal of autonomy to act on their own. So, 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 so that's the Hunzas, right? The Hunzas are in Gilgit, Pakistan, but it's not the Gilgit agency. That, that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a separate uh, part that happens in the future. But, but now, so as I say, nominally under the education board. So these are the main casts of characters. What do the British do? Very complicated history, without spending too much time on it. Basically, they come to two lines. Right? One is a line that is drawn by Johnson and Ada. So Johnson does the first line. It's 1865. Ada then Colonel Ada then sort of tweaks the line a little bit. With that line, what it says is that the claims of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir of the British, but therefore of the princely state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, goes right up to the Kulun Bridge. So that's the line. And I keep on saying that that's the line. It's the Johnson and Ada line that is in our mind when we think of our map of India. Except. In 1899, that is after 30 years of, of God knows what, it is rejected by Governor General Elliot. Because the Governor General makes a very specific point. Because remember at that point, you have Britain locked in in a great game in Central Asia, right, with the Russians, the Tsarist Russians. So their biggest worry at that point is that the Russians will kind of come in and they will be in contact. And British India at that point had this policy of maintaining buffers. Buffers were a very important strategic concept for them. They said, well, if we have to maintain buffer, why not give, reject this line, and concede some territory, give it to the Chinese? Right? Because that means China is considered a relatively friendly part. Oh. Chinese is a bit because again, no, 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 not Tibetans. Not Tibetans. Not Tibetans. No, no, Tibet. 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 no, no this, yes, sir. So this is it. No, but but it's a, it's a good point that you raise, and it's good that you, that this this happened, because there have been Chinese scholars of Qing Dynasty who have said that at that point, even the Qing Dynasty didn't have a very clear view of what China was. So this has been made. Yes, this is this is Xinjiang. This is so. But but the worry there is more with the Kyrgyz coming to Kashgar, and, and so this is with the Chinese, so, so that line is rejected. What comes up instead, what is accepted by the British, but the Chinese go silent on it, is the second line, which is the McCartney McDonald line in 1899, right? And this is concessions around, around Aksai Chin that is, that is made. Uh, what is the reason? They, they want to cut out the meal of Hunza. Hunza is a princely state. They are worried that, that because by then they have already formed the Gilgit Agency. Gilgit Agency gets formed, I think, in 18, 1889, when a political resident is appointed. So the Gilgit Agency is uh, is formed. They know that they can directly deal with Kashgar. So they have McCartney, who's supposed to be there. But they're also worried that Neil of Hansa, who I suspect was a man of entrepreneurial attitude, would, would, would be interested in, in, in talking. <coughs> To, to Kashgar. So there is this letter where, where uh, explicitly the government of India says, where, where it says, we do not want the Dean of Hanza to be dealing with Kashgar. McCartan is there. And so, so that is the first concession that's made. So they send this letter out to the Chinese that we are willing to make this. Karzan is very happy. They said, you know, we are giving too much to the Chinese. They should be very happy with, with all of this. Guess what? The Chinese never reply. So, so, so it's, it's one of those things where it, so, and so, but then the British are thinking, this is a Gandhi, right? Um, another thing that happens uh, on the Eastern sector is, of course, the 27th uh, uh, Shimla uh, Convention, 27th April 1940 where uh, the Macron line is drawn, but I'm not going to focus too much on that. I'm going to focus on the Eastern sector. Here's a map of, of the various claims and counter claims. Um, this is the Kulun range. This is the Johnson line, right? Um, there is the, for, for the time being, just ignore a couple of other lines. This is the green line, which is the McCartney Macron. You see, you see the difference that they, how they kind of conceive this territory right here, right? In Aksai Chin, most of it in Aksai Chin, right? 
and the rest and the rest I will come to a little later. So the rest are like the current line of control and so on, and the line of actual control and so on. So, but I just want to point these two lines that you fix in your mind: the Johnson line, Johnson Arduck line, and the uh, McCartney McDonald uh, line. What happens between? So this is this is up to. 47, but then the World, world War I, uh, one, two clicks down. There are some claims that around 1941, uh, the British finally decide that it is probably a good idea to go all the way to the Arda, the Johnson Arda line, because of the Soviet presence at that point. I've seen the claims a couple of times, but I've not been able to verify this independently with, with archival or other scholarly sources. But I just wanted to kind of leave it. <coughs> 47 happens, we all know what happens on 15th August, right? Ah. One thing that, that is important is that in July of 47, the con British control of Gilgit is passed back to Harrison. And that, that I think becomes very important later on for our claim to Gilgit Baltasar, because that control happens. But then many other things happen. 26th October, obviously, Harrison signs the instrument of accession. Um, but right around that time, there's a rebellion inside Gilgit. So the Gilgit scouts, led by a British officer, rebels. Uh, and against the Dogra government, because at that point, because the control was transferred back to Prince Lee State, a Dogra governor was appointed, and this British officer with Gilgit scouts rebelled. So they changed their mind. <laughs> Actually, John Brown himself fomented this rebellion. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> but, but anyway, this, this becomes okay. a little moot because very soon India Pakistan war breaks out. The first war breaks out. Line of control is a, the ceasefire line, which then becomes line of control in 72 with some adjustment, is accepted on 27 uh, uh, July 1949. POK unfortunately is created, which now includes the <coughs> If you can just by the sheer features of the map, it, 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 where the line of control goes, and then there's Siachen, so this kind of shifts there. Right. What is also very interesting here is another small point. It's not just Gilgit about Pakistan that goes. There is the Shakshun Valley, the trans karakoram tract, again by virtues of geography in, uh, in, than anything else, also falls into Pakistan hands. It complicates our lives later. And, 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 and that Shakshun Valley used to be under the mirror of the and it used to be controlled. 26 November 1949, of course, Constituent Assembly approves the Indian Constitution. Uh, the first schedule linked with Article 1, defines Jammu and Kashmir as the territory which immediately before the commencement of this constitution is comprised in the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir. It's still there in it's, it's the first schedule, right? So the entry. But there's a problem here. And there's a problem that Shivshankar Menon, for example, points out in this in his book, in Choices. If you look at the map of India that existed on that day when the constitution came into force, the entire western frontier, this Aksai Chin, is, is marked as undefined. There's a color wash. I've not seen the map, but I've read that the map, map is color wash. And so that that is an important legal point. Of course, India rectifies it in 54, 53. It's 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 but but how do you how do you define? I mean, there should be a corresponding map, right, in terms of fixed. <laughs> Can we come back to all the Yes, yes, yes. yes. Come back to um, 1954, Constitution application of JNT order is passed. Of course, that is the one that gets chucked on, on, on August 5th, uh, this year, when 50. So, by the way, I want to uh, make, a, make a point before I kind of go through this list, which is that uh, the 50s and between 47 to 1963, to my mind, those 16 years are the most important in the history of India China relations. Because most of the problems, most of the movement, most of the cutting thrust happens during those 60 years. What happens in 1950? Obviously, PLA invades Tibet. 1951, China controls Tibet. Control is passed. The agreement between PRC and Dalai Lama. Nehru plays a role in that, right, in, in, in facilitating the 17 point agreement. Um, October 54, Nehru visits Beijing and raises the boundary issue with China. So it's not it's not that Nehru raises it in '58 or '59. That's a misnomer. '54 is when Nehru first raises it uh, with with Chow in line. Chow, Chinese basically tell him uh, that don't worry about it too much. These are old maps. We're in the process of fixing them, so on and so forth. '56, Chow visits Delhi. Again, the same story is that Nehru claims that Chow had accepted the Mumbai, 
even though he said, well, I don't like the name McMahon line, because it sounds very British, but I'm willing to accept the McMahon line, but I have to consult the Tibetan authorities. Well, that all of this is there in a letter that Nehru writes to Chao uh, on, on uh, December 14, 1958, when things kind of uh, kind of deteriorate significantly. The most important factor that comes in here is what happens in between 55 and October 57. So there is a road that is built from Xinjiang to Tibet, right, that passes through Aksaji. I'm going to show you the map, so, so, so don't worry. And I'll explain to you why that map is, uh, why that road is built. Because in the 1950s, China essentially had three roads through which mainland China would connect. One was, maybe I, this is the point where I show them. One was the road that would pass from the north. There is another road from Sichuan that passes from, from the east. But these two roads, and of course there's one that goes from India, right, from, through the Chumbi Valley, but discounting that. But these two roads have a problem. The problem with these two roads is that most of the time, the weather conditions, the topography of, of these roads would make any movement, the other movement, relatively expensive. There's only one road, which is also kind of bad, but which is the least bad of the three roads. And that is the one that goes from Kaskar, passes through Aksai comes all the way close to Lhasa, not really to Lhasa, but very close to Lhasa. This road has an advantage. The main advantage of this road is that it's open all year round. Right? So it's not snowing. So this construction happens between 55 and 57, October 57. India gets to hear of this, at least publicly, through Chinese media articles. And, and this is where, uh, yes, and this is this is where it raises a serious alarm. So in 58, there is a memorandum to China about that, that they've set up. But this is, this is, and this is an important point to now bring in some of the theory that I want to explain that I am developing myself. In my mind, and this is Garber makes this point, John Garber in his, in his classic study of India-China relations. Garber makes this argument that India's pressure on China's control over Aksai because India is, at that point, remember, because in Nehru's mind, and in the, in the, in the minds of the Indian government, McMahon line is settled. It's all, unlike the Western sector, McMahon line is drawn on, on, on NEFA, that's a NEFA part, so it's like, but there's nothing to worry about. So why does he pre pressure on Aksai The calculation could have been that one way to keep pressure on Aksai and inter alia on that Xinjiang Tibet highway is because if you can keep a pressure on the PLA on that sector, maybe you can gain, maybe Tibet can gain a reasonable degree of autonomy because there was a hope that there would be some degree of autonomy at that point. So you see the beginning of, of something. You see this inexorable link between Aksai Chin and Tibet. And this is a story that continues to date that the next becomes linked and the beginning of linkage as, uh, as this, uh, as, 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 as an ocean. January 59, Chow and Lai drops with a bomb on, on, on everything. And he says, he disputes the entire India China about it. He says, no, 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 McMahon line, we don't accept McMahon line, we don't accept, uh, uh, you know, Johnson line in the Western sector. It says, we can discuss the whole package. Now, various interpretations. Sham Saran says PRC disputes Eastern sector not because of India's claim, but because India raises the Xinjiang Tibet highway. Because up and until that point, Nehru himself says, you know, when China Lai had accepted the McMahon line. So there is again that, 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 that element of linkage. But there's also another very strange thing, and this is also in Sham Saran's new book, and, and, and which is based on his, uh, Nehru's correspondence that he discovers with Yu Nu, who was the uh, uh, Burmese. Premier, because remember, Burma is also a party to the McMahon line. And the Chinese had no problems, by the way, with, with the McMahon line when it comes to Burma. It just seems that they certainly had a problem with, with India. But in the correspondence that, that Sham Saran presents on, on, on Nehru's uh, silence on Aksai Chin, uh, or, or on, on Nehru's correspondence with Yu, Nehru never talks about Aksai Chin. In fact, in the 57 letter he sends to Yu, he says, India China border is settled. There, there, is, there is some technical issues we hope to sort out. So what, what is going on? So there is a silence there, right? 59 again he said another letter to you, which which is the same story. Of course then 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 but but at the same time I also discovered that there's a uh, December 62 memorandum from MEA to the Chinese embassy after after the 
conflict. Where India categorically says, listen, we have patrolled Aksai Chin repeatedly, six or seven times between 51 and 58. So it's not that India was not aware of this problem, but Nehru's silence. There's still, I think, there's something that, that, that needs to be sort of put together. 59, of course, March 59, Dalai Lama is offered refuge in Delhi, uh, in, in India, so it's in, in, in India, after the PLA massacre in Lhasa, PLA News Center is a, is a huge uh, massacre. Um, April 16th is when the first link offer comes from China, which China says that Chao comes to Delhi and says East West Swap. Aksai Chin, in, in return of PR, PRC recognizing it, Macmillan Bank, because India says they can't call it the PLA This offer keeps on coming back a couple of times. I mean, go. 62, India and China war starts. Now, I don't want to get into this. Who started? Why? This is, this is a never-ending debate, right? But what happens is that at the end of hostilities in November 62, China promises to pull back 20 kilometers from what they consider the line of actual control to its position on November 7, 59. Now, to my mind, Nehru very rightly rejects this. Because as he says, what is this line of control? According to who? And 20 kilometers from where? Right? Because you can arbitrarily draw some line somewhere and say, look, I've moved back to the kilometers. So it's kind of, kind of meaningless. And in fact, LSC, to my mind, as a legal basis, the phrase LSC and nego formal negotiations about LSC, it's a legal basis for, uh, for talks, only happens in 93. Before that, LSC, even uncomfortably, even the phrase uh, line of factory control. Of course, another thing happens in 63, which is China transfers the control of the Shaksham Valley to or Pakistan transfers the control of the Shaksham Valley to China as part of the Sino-Pakistan frontier agreement. And remember, our claim to that is because of the roundabout way of Miro Funza, we used to run. 79 to 2005, nothing much happened. Uh, 2005, a few things happened. Well, from 63 to, to 79, nothing much happens. Deep uh, distrust. Though in 70, Mao reaches us uh, out to the then Shaje, uh, Brajesh Mishra, uh, at the Chinese National Day celebration. Now, again, Garber in another book in, 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 in 16 makes an interesting point. He says that, that hmm? Chinese National Day. Chinese National Day. So it's in like October. So, but China worries, and this is an interpretation, that China worries that, as Garber says in his latest book, that throughout this, 70s China is very worried that in the event of another India-China war, Beijing would not enjoy the support of any super power. Unlike 62, because remember, Cuban missile crisis was going on when, when that was happening here. And Soviets were maybe happier to accommodate China at that point because of the Cuban missile crisis. That doesn't happen. Complete thaw or, or complete freeze in relationship. First thought appears when Vajpayee, who was then the Moraji government, uh, foreign ministry, he travels to Beijing in February 1979. And that is something, then the first science, so I've been talking about linkage, but there's another concept I want to bring in, which is that the delinkage. And the first science of delinkage happens at that meeting, where delinkage between the boundary dispute and, and the cooperation of problems and other issues. So at that point, the PRC foreign minister Wang Wa gives an interview to PTI, where he states that Vajpayee had told him that uh, but the boundary issue should not constitute a hindrance to improvement of our bilateral relations. Now we would later on see that that is Wang Wa's line for some time, mm -hmm. Wang's line also. Now Bajpai is, by the way, then asked for a clarification on this. PTI goes and says, and Bajpai says, no, 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 full normalization can only happen in the boundary dispute itself. So did, 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 was it Wang Wa saying, Bajpai saying, but anyway, this is what the archive or, or what the historical shows. Um, Wang pursues this delinkage strategy uh, during a visit to Delhi in June 81. But the interesting thing is implicit in the strategy of delinking about the boundary dispute with cooperation with other matters is a strategy of linkage. Because the idea is that if you improve relations on other spheres, maybe you create a condition in which the boundary dispute can eventually be solved. So it's interesting to pursue delinkage with linkage in, in mind. In, in, in but there's another deal in that happens with that one while visit. But China's relation with India, and China makes it very clear to South Asian states, Pakistan in particular, that we may pursue good relations with India, but that does not mean that we've not pursued good relations with you. So there's also a deal that happens 
very explicitly, mm -hmm. and not just with Pakistan, crucially also by then with Bangladesh as well. Uh, 81 to 85, there is the the first, well, 1980, Tang again. So this is a Chao formula comes back in December of 80, when Tang informally proposes. Mind you, all of these proposals that I'm talking about, swaps, this, that, they never won a record on them. This is all, all, all informal. So Tang gives an interview to, I think, the Indian magazine. And, and he says, he brings back the Chao formula of swapping Aksai Chin with with, with, with uh, line and, and, and that Parma Chin. That, the part. India rejects this offer again. Tang proposes this again in 82 to Ambassador Park that year. That in any case, because of all of this, I think at that point the foreign minister was Nasima Rao, who says that you know it's welcome development, we will start talking. That at least you know, so the first is the rounds of, of, of border discussions continue. For the, between 81 and 85, and as far as I can I could tell, China is Beijing delinks this east-west linkage. And it's only for a small period that they are saying, we agree to, because India's thing is no linkage sector by sector. Right? So, so but 81 to 85, as far as I can tell, is the only time that there is a, uh, China accepts that, that formula of going sector by sector. Of course, 85, the, 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 well, 81 to 84, I would say. Because 85, China, in the sixth round of talks, China, again, uh, you, you know, sort of, kind of takes a very hard position, right? And this is once when they explicitly demand, demand Tawang. The demand for Tawang, I think, becomes explicit in the, in the sixth round in 1985. By 86, linkage is back, mysteriously. But this time, the linkage logic is flipped around. They said, listen, you make concessions to us in, in around my own line around Tawang, and maybe we can give you something in Aksai So remember that the 60 and 80, the logic went Aksai Chin to my own line, Chinese point. 86, they flip it around. They say it goes from from uh, Macmahon line to Aksai Chin, that happens. 86, 87, of course, we all know that there is a tense military standoff between India and China around the Sundarum Chu. It's north of Tawang. It's, it's, it's a canyon. Like future, Rajiv Gandhi puts it. Uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Can, 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 can he, can he, can he, He's been there. <laughs> no, no. It just means river. So it doesn't mean that. Oh, anyway. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, the so Operation Checkerboard is 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 put. December '86, something very big happens. Arunachal is created. Nepal is 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 built. Arunachal. '88, the Tang Gandhi uh, Rajiv Gandhi summit invasion, very important because that is when both sides say Tang tells him that listen, you know, the world is changing, economic realities are changing, new economic order, India, China, so on and so forth. But I think Rajiv Gandhi also pushes for resolution of the of the dispute. Um, the main thing, so I'll kind of quickly, because I want to get to the strategy part of it, so I'll kind of quickly go through the rest. And I think these are, this is basically known to this audience. 7th September, is, uh, is, uh, 93 is very important, because that's when the agreement of the maintenance of peace and tranquility in the India-China border areas during Nasimara's visit to Beijing is signed. This is, again, as I said, the first time where LSC is accepted in, a, in the Indian formulation. Except the reference to LSC, as Shakunda Menon very nicely puts it, would be unqualified without prejudice as to where the respective stands on the boundary lines. You have to understand that the line of actual control is very peculiar. Because in the sense that it's not demarcated, it's not delineated. But there's a tacit acceptance of what it considers. Very different from the line of control, which is where DTMOs sign, you know, it's, it's a map that has signatures of the respective DTMOs. And uh, of course, in 2005, you have the uh, agreement of it's the uh, political parameters and guiding principles agreement. This is considered as a major victory for India because one of the articles, Article 7, talks about uh, not disturbing any solution should not disturb settlements. It's a major victory because that means that you can't you can't uh, move along around too much because that's a settlement. So, so, so that's considered as a major. 2006 present, I think we all know this. Uh, 
promptly after political parameters and guiding principles agreement, in China reverts back to the law. SR talks, to my mind, basically is deadlock since. I mean, every year we hear something, nothing happens. 2015, China unveils the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. That's a very big development because it passes through gilgit baltistan Actually, the gilgit baltistan to, to Pakistan road was there. What happens is now that there are a lot of features that are put and this sort of, sort of enhanced. 2017, Doklam. Uh, but in 2017, another thing happens before Doklam. This is interesting. It happens in, in, in March with the a former state councillor, Jai. He brings linkage back. Meanwhile, everybody is thinking that linkage had died. And he says, no, linkage is bad. Because he's, but he says, if the Indian side takes care of China's concern in the eastern sector, the Chinese side will respond accordingly and address India's concern elsewhere. So it's just without that 81 to 85, to my mind, the east and west is linked. Except now, as I said, like 86, the logic has been reversed. That it is concessions around the one that affects any decisions on that side chain. Again, unofficial propo proposal, again, unacceptable from from, from non-negotiable from India's standpoint. And of course, we know what happened in the last couple of days. August 9th, you know, Ladakh, including Aksai is brought under direct central control. And uh, 12th uh, August, EM reminds uh, Waini that, and it's a very interesting wording to my mind, in the external affairs minister's statement, he says, there was no implication either for either the external boundaries of India or the line of actual control. The two. He could have just left, left it that there's no implications for external boundaries. Why say or the line of actual control? Uh, I think it's very crafty. I, I first felt that when I first reacted to the solution yes, on reflection it seems very crafty because since the LSE is neither demarcated nor delineated, you can add that. That's a way of assuaging the Chinese that we can maybe still work around the LSE, but you're not committing to anything because of you know, the nature of the LSE. But would the Chinese buy it? I don't know. There's a tacitly accepted LSE, which implies Aksai Chin is in Chinese control. To conclude, I will just now, this was all a long history for, for 42 minutes, a little over time, but just, just to kind of get to the crux of what I am suggesting here. What you are seeing in all of this is our strategies of linkage. Now, what is a strategy of linkage? A strategy of linkage involves linking one issue area to secure or generate concessions in another issue area. The master of strategy of linkage was Henry Kissinger. But during the the, the, the off phase of us us uh, relations, it was always linking immigration of, of emigration of Jews to this issue, to that issue. So it's, you link two issue areas. Such strategies can be pursued, but they can also be pursued within one issue area where there are seven sub areas, as we have seen with the east-west package, where there's this constant linking that happens. To flip this around, there's something called this. We can also define a strategy of dealing with it, which is not favoring one issue area over another, and therefore not prioritizing security military issues over other subjects. In academic IR literature, you see this in k one and 9 in one of the conditions of, of compensation defendants. With these definitions in mind, what are the stylized observations for the last 40 minutes that have been made? Within the boundary settlement issues, China has perceived strategies of linkages in 1960, 1980, 1986, and 2017, as I said first, where concessions in Aksai leads to PRC concessions on Macron line, and the remaining two instances where, where the, the argument is flipped. Since 79-80, China has pursued a strategy of delinkage between political and economic cooperation with India and boundary settlement, India firmly accepted this framework in 1993 with a peace and tranquility agreement. But China's pursuit of delinking the above between political, military, uh, political economic cooperation and boundary settlement has also been accompanied by another delinkage, which is between its ties with India and Pakistan and India and Bangladesh. But in this, India has also followed a very similar strategy. So we pursue both relations, we say, with China. But we also try and do this with Japan or Vietnam or most importantly the United States. Right? All of this, to my mind, can be summarized with a very small picture. And it's this. So imagine there are, there are four, four issue areas. It's a very stylized uh, picture. A stands for positions of either countries on upside chain. B stands for either countries' positions on the long line. By the way, there's a middle sector yeah, of the border. But that is more or less of the boundary, sorry. 
Well, in places it's actually about it. But that is more or less with some technical um, adjustments that should be fine. So it's basically a section in like AMD, both countries' positions. And CMD represents both countries' positions on political cooperation and economic cooperation. So you just have a very stylized picture in mind. So you can divide convergence and divergence and respective uses of strategies into four quarters one, two, three, and four. With this, I will just conclude with what I think is the <coughs> some abstract sum of everything that I've said. A and B linked by China on at least four occasions, as I've just explained. D linking C, which is economic cooperation. By economic cooperation, I also mean not just trade, I also mean cooperation with multilateral economic fora, and so on and so forth. The D linking of C from A and B, which is a two border uh, with a boundary issues. That happens during Kant's meeting with Rajiv Gandhi in, in, in 88, I don't know, just described. But C has been delinked from D. C is economic cooperation, governance cooperation. D, to my mind, political, is political military, security military, other than the boundary. But C has been delinked from D for a long time. So convergence on global government, the governance, for example, has been, between India and China has not translated to political convergence and security issues. There are talks of SCO maybe helping us do some counter terror exercises, but beyond that, from South China Sea, so on and so forth. There is no problem. So that's a kind of the abstract picture. I'll leave you with some questions as opposed to answering them and discuss them. Can India link D? So remember, D is political, political military cooperation to position on A to secure concessions on B. Let me say, what is that? Okay. So, in English, it is, in other words, put India's, for example, acquiescence or Chinese position in South China Sea. Acquiescence may be too strong. <coughs> Study silence. On, on, in return of China's silence on the accession assertion that just happens on, on August 9, could it be used to settle the McMahon line issue? Can this link its strategy to play? I don't know. Talk about it. Can India's does India's move on A, which is accession, which is now union, union territory of, of India, and its position on, on, on a bargaining position on the McMahon line? Remember, we have always been on the back, as far as I can see. In the sense that they have made assertions, they have extended claims, they have said South Tibet, so on and so forth. Can we turn this around? Can we say it's union territory, and we are very serious about all of this, right? Does that help us link back? Can we play the link? And go back to the I don't know, is it, is it something that can be done? Can India leverage through connectivity, leverage C, which is which is economic cooperation, through connectivity cooperation, BCI, for example, to affect India's position on the on B? Yeah. Does recent developments in JNK mean that India will China will reverse link A with B, returning to the Chao Gang formula? Remember that they have flipped it around and it was all concessions in Tawang for Aksai Now we have claimed Aksai Chin reaffirmed our research, very strong. Does that mean that they may actually try to block it and they may now flip it around in the next round of SR talks, and I think they will announce today in a few months. Uh, can, can, can they reverse back to the job on formula? And finally, say, so will India's position of IT lead to Chinese hardening, an adverse Indian uh, uh, position, adverse in the Chinese mind? Would that lead to Chinese hardening on A and B, which is the, on the body disputes? I don't put the answers to this question, but I just include it some part using the conceptual framework that just presented. Thank you. the floor for discussion, just one point uh, which has been uh, clarified by Mr. Uh, Ching two days ago. Statement by Home Minister in uh, Parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks about the uh, okay also this part. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is not in any way a new position. Yeah. In fact, uh, it's an old position. So I don't think you know, we need to harp on that too much. Frankly, if you look at uh, the statement which I can show you in the 
post after we can do this to the university and for the community. And also, you know, remarks made by Mr. Fork. So it has been stated quite clearly that these developments do not amount to any additional territorial claims. Uh, this was to allay you know, many, many doubts at the time which you are referring to. Uh, nor do they have any bearing on line of actual control with China. With China, we don't have international boundaries, line of actual control with China, or international boundary or line of control with Pakistan. <coughs> in Pakistan, we have we have both international boundary and line of control with Pakistan. I think this position has been stated very categorically. Uh, in a somewhat you know, uh, unusual move, uh, it was uh, reiterated in a press readout, a fairly detailed press readout. I don't think we need to dwell too much on uh, any new claim being made by India or Maksai Jinn. No, we just, uh, we just need to look at the map of India. Uh, map of India includes uh, you know, the area under occupation of China and Nasai Chin, and also, you know, not just in Nasai Chin, the western sector also yes. south of that, you know, and then China and some other areas there. This is, I think, this point needs to be, to be as one of the characters. But now, yeah, if I may, uh, I'd just like to make a few quick bullet points, which I think have a fundamental bearing on our understanding of the subject. And I'll speak only up to a few, the, uh, few points, up to the point at which you said 1979 Mao reached out uh, to, the, to India. To British Mishra. 1979 is 70. 70. 70. They reached out to India. Your thing said 79. No, no, no. Yeah, it says 79. No, deep distrust. October 1970. Okay, fair, fair enough. Uh, I, so I'll just quickly start. Firstly, Aksai Chin, the word itself, the term, is not a Tibetan word. Which one? Aksai Chin. Aks means white in Turkey. And we have a Tibetan speaker here who can tell us that uh, the word for white in Tibetan is completely different. So Aksai Chin was raised by Turkey peoples. It was not really a Tibetan area. So the people of Kashgar was that Yeah, basically from that area. So it's a Turkey word for a term which Turkey people used to come to. It's not really part of Tibet. Okay. LSE, which is connected with it, cannot be defined for the simple reason it is as far as the light machine guns of your forward troops can reach. And constant, not even artillery, because that can reach 30, 40 kilometers. 2005 principle would agree with that. But I agree, but. This is why no country in the world will ever be, uh, agree on an LSE because it cannot be defined on the ground, it cannot be de de uh, delimited and demarcated. It's just a concept of where your light machine guns and your uh, weapon fire, direct weapon fire from the forward troops goes. That's all it means. And therefore, it can't be a term in uh, international relations. Um, second, the Mir of Hunza was a vassal <coughs> of the Raja of Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these things are based on those earlier principles, Asian principles of vassalage and not Westphalian again. Mm -hmm. Consequently, all this issue of, this, you know, we didn't want the Mira Hunza doing this or, and so on. And the, and the Hunza puts had grazing on the other side, mm -hmm. which the Pakistanis have given away. And when you talk about Gilgit Pakistan, the Gil, Gilgit Pakistan was separated because uh, but Gilgit was in, is inhabited by the Bartis. They speak a different language, entirely different language from the Hunzakuns. There are different people. Uh, Pakistan was known as Little Tibet if you look at the older books. And, uh, and they, they and the Tibetans and the Zakis can all each understand each other's language. Uh, so, you know, when we Go into these, we realize that a lot of these have traditional or background issues. Johnson himself, the surveyor, was an employee of the government of, of the Raja of Kashmir. 
right? So his interest was to increase the space for the uh, Raja and hoping to get some financial reward. So, uh, I mean, he had other personal issues involved. Uh, um, no, fact of the matter. No, no, no that's true. Huh? Fascinating what you're saying. Yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Then, then this other issue of uh, the Makman line. The Makman line actually is a boundary line which defined, there were two of them. As you know, we are only talking of the outer one, which defined the outer bound, the boundary of outer Tibet. That's right. Right? It's the boundary of outer Tibet. So, since those were drawn for another purpose entirely, we assume that the Chinese will accept it, and thereafter, all these other things that flow down. So, we we must look at it in in that sense. Um, then this, uh, you didn't mention that we first reached out. India first reached out to China diplomatically after the 62 freeze in December 1975. I, I think that was important. Though you, you said that Mao reached out in in 1970 uh, to Rajesh Mishra, really, nothing really happened. This I happen to know from personal experience because I was at the first meeting. Uh, how, as a captain, is another strange story, but never mind. I was there. I briefed Mrs. Indira Gandhi myself, after which all this started. Uh, I know what followed. So it's uh, December 1975, okay? Uh, a thing which you might have mentioned. And uh, now coming to this, when, whenever we talk of it is undefined traditional boundary, in the old Asian system of things, particularly in the mountains, this uh, thing between uh, Tibet and the Dogras, so Rawal Singh, was instrumental in creating some of these lines. And he was a general of the Dogra Rajas, who the Dogra Rajas himself, themselves were vassal of the Lahore Tarpa. So we need to see some of these linkages before we jump to conclusions about it being India and Britain. So um, traditional in those days, before Westphalian concepts were adopted by China, it just they just gave the line of passes. It was assumed that the line ran along the mountains. Assumed the Chinese. So did everyone. Everybody did so. Which is which is why our 1954 agreement just names the passes. Because the traditional way of defining the boundary was naming the places where you could cross. There was no need to do this because only the Westerners, the Europeans did this. It's only after China turned Western on this subject that we started having this problem. Oh, where is the line? Where is the demark delimitation, the demarcation, well, they never did it. So when you, we say undefined, that was the way things work all over Asia. Mountain tops, mountain tops. There was no need. They only used to name the passes. This, on this side of the passes are, that side is yours. There was never any issue of mountain. I mean, this thought process was brought in by the Chinese later, and we fall into it. Now, and lastly, I talking too long. When we say that, uh, you know, that the Chinese are accepting this or doing this or linking with the boundary, I think the Chinese are just playing us. We say boundary issue and they've happily accepted the term. In their minds, it's not a boundary issue. There's no boundary issue. There's a territory issue in Chinese minds. They prefer to use what we call a boundary issue because it's so distant. I just leave this for your consideration. Thank you. <coughs> I have a bit of a different uh, question. Uh, you know, I mean, we can quite understand what our home minister said. But I still am not very clear exactly what the Chinese meant by saying that you will actually. I mean, hmm. what does it actually mean even in Chinese uh, addiction and Chinese <coughs> theories, their legal theory? What does it actually mean? Because uh, uh, going on that basis, uh, when we declared uh, uh, a much for example, the Chinese protest to say that we can't do it? No, if they say that we can't do it, or they said you are, or, or what, that you are still in legal control of that area. The point actually, the raising the issue of law, that you cannot in this area is ours. You cannot do that. Yeah. change in terms of administration let's say. But uh, <coughs> nothing happened. My only thing is that as I look at it now from this other point of view, maybe the Chinese feel that uh, because of the fact that you know we are look on the background that we get silence South China Sea. A lot of these things happen. <coughs> <coughs> Malabar and so 
<coughs> the Chinese think that the area coming under our direct control, our actually means that my uh, direct control might actually uh, mean that this will come for them another pressure point. Could be, I don't know. And for that, they are finding some kind of a legalese to say that you can't do this, you can't do that. Because on legal ground, I mean, they have no legal standard. Because, as the minister said, the LSE is what you are following. Nothing will change that basis. And uh, we are doing what we are doing. I mean, if we impose, let us say, a few in Leh, in Ladakh, in fact, the Chinese don't sell protest, don't say buy done that. So, I am just wondering in what context can we actually interpret this? And second point is that with all the Pakistan's raised the issue that we have changed the status uh, by advocating or uh, hauling out Article 370. By taking lines converging somewhat converging to Pakistan, they're actually hinting to us that uh, both India, both China and Pakistan will create trouble for immigration. I don't know. That could be another pressure point on their side. I don't know. <coughs> um, start so with, with your uh, remarks. Very, very interesting. Um, I think that, and I completely agree with you, that, that part of the problem with India and China is, as you say, that the Asian system, especially in mountainous regions, are very different. It's not linear boundaries. First of all, it, I think often it's very difficult to even draw a linear boundary in a very mountainous region. They never region. even tried. Right. right. Uh, but that said, the fact is Australian states are now and more. And including in Asia. So, so and, uh, and if we can't, you know, it very well could be that they have reacted because we have started talking about boundary disputes. And in fact, that's something I, I recollected earlier, in, right at the beginning of my presentation, when I said that the things were fine with the McMahon line, it seemed, until we started complaining about accessing about the Xinjiang to that road. And that's when they start reacting. If they're not too much concerned about some line as a uh, or that may or may not exist, but because that, that has a very tangible consequence for China's control, Beijing's control. <coughs> but but the point is that, 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 so on that point I agree, but, but the fact of the matter is this problem has to be solved maybe, maybe, maybe in some way. So your point about Ladakh is a fresh point, very well could be, very well could be. But they they perceive that. They were, we, or they, they might use that from their side of pressure. But, 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 but the interesting thing there is that, Based on all my conversations with American scholars and, and, and officials, the sense I get is that the United States does not want to get involved in a land thing, in, in, in any kind of a land commitment with India against. The ground issue is statement. Statements are fine, but I'm saying it's statements. It's in the sense, in the sense, can you think about doing a, a land exercise, a joint exercise between the United States Army and the Indian Army? Would they be interested in doing it? We won't do that. But 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 the, but, but the point is that that we do the air exercise. We do. That's right. We do the. But 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 I, the sense I get talking to them is that there is a degree of reluctance. Uh, in fact, one of them told me that you know. And at that point, it's like us, that, that you know, what happens if there is another door? What can you do for us? Because that, that's our concern. We have a, a line factory control. We test. Uh, so what can you do? And they say, well, we, you know, we can provide some intelligence. And that's about it. Some satellite imagery, some intelligence. And, and it's a very hands-up thing. So, but, but, but it could very well be that the Chinese see this, see this as, a, as, a, as, a, as a very different way. The Chinese see Brooklyn as a third-party intervention. Yeah, they don't see it the way we see it. Hmm. No, but it was a third party intervention at the end of the day. It's right. So it's so it's <laughs> it was not, not, not our know, the joint that protocol actually is for this to they, they use the same logic in the in the Chinese language press to talk about gilded parties. This is about Tawang. Uh, I, I was posted in Tawang and remained there for about three years and I have done a lot of patrolling around this. Uh, what I would say is Tawang is a populated area as everybody knows. And the population is only towards India because of their culture which is Tibetan and they follow the Dolinus Dalai Lama 100% Mokpas, Mokpas of Tawang. So, 
how Chinese as per 2005 agreement populated areas are not to be disturbed. So yes. how and why they are claiming the uh, one under which ground this is against 2005 agreement. This is question to you and also to Chinese. <laughs> I can speak for myself. <laughs> can you allow me? Yes. Uh, what position you had there in Taiwan? I was recently in Taiwan, so I was trying to make something quite easy. The interesting thing is that the Taiwan part is, is explicitly brought back in 2006. So 2005 is, is, is the, uh, the guiding uh, parameter sequence which that agreement is done. A simple explanation is they simply don't care about an agreement. This wouldn't be the first time. I'll bring you a very interesting, slightly uh, distinct but related point. If you look at the defense white paper of, of that came out 10 years or so ago, they explicitly say we reserve the right to militarize the features in South China Sea, the features that they, they created. This is in direct contradiction to a commitment Xi Jinping made in 2015 to President Obama. So it shows a certain disregard for for uh, for uh, Western notions such as agreements and and, and, and and so on and so forth. So 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 I so that's that's a very good point. In fact. You know the, the, the interview that the state, former state councillor was a negotiator between 2013 and 20, 23 and 2013 in the, in the boundary dispute, the, the, the state councillor died. He had gone and said that, you know, Tawang, again, he said Tawang is important, you give us Tawang, everything else will go through the Knowing very well, I mean, he was present when, when that 2005 agreement happened. So it very well could be that they, they simply don't care. Change I'll change position, but then if you change positions on agreements, yeah. <laughs> 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 Sir, can I, uh, my mind goes back to 1979, not in terms of what you are presented here, but in 1979, that is when I began to work as a young professional on China, there was this famous global atlas that China had published. And in that atlas, the starting point was that the Chinese territories, I don't remember the words that they exactly knew, but this is the this was the inference, extend to wherever the Chinese had been. <laughs> and by that by that definition, the whole globe is actually China by now. I'm saying that basically because you know we think now in terms of Westphalian concepts where sovereignty is defined by the boundaries. To my mind, the sovereignty for China <coughs> does not depend upon territory. The sovereignty for China extends to the need for influence resources. Tibet, for example, the need to annex Tibet was not at that time any strategic need or anything. But the need to annex Tibet was because in their own mind they thought the Tibetans who were part of the ethnic communities in China for them and who used to pay to give to them were getting a bit too big for the both and they needed to be brought under control. There was no strategic need or anything at all but just to teach a lesson to them. Similarly, South South East uh, China Seas is a contest for the resources. So my simple point is that if Chinese sovereignty is decided not by territory but by the need to acquire resources and need to in, uh, need to retain their areas of influence, I then I think all of these things really do not mean so much. What we need to really see is how do we basically make our own areas of influence rather than just territory. Uh, I'm, I think I'm getting a bit vague here at this stage, no, no. but the thought really is we need to understand the Chinese ideas of what they want 
and only then this will make a sense again. Okay. Um, Actually, you've been very modestly quiet. A lot of things we could cover you've been personally involved. And that is a show. And some of it I have been uh, involved. Um, uh, I just, uh, first thing which I have not involved, I just want to uh, make a point. That, uh, let's not get into the argument just now, I just want to say, point out things. That it's not suddenly that uh, this uh, West Indian line of the Chinese. The British tried desperately to get lines. That's right. So uh, let's get the, that, and that goes back to end of 19th century. Okay, um, right. Uh, I can also answer this question when it was signing the Tibetans later on this mid 19th century. Who was signing what? But I don't think that's too relevant to what I want to say. The other things uh, now. Uh, and also, you know, it is not that we were uh, suddenly only passes, passes, passes. The critical thing is not in 1954 suddenly passes. Nehru takes a very firm decision to firm up what was undefined in the Western sector. That was a line, you know, because he was <coughs> very conscious of the importance uh, of having a firm line once the Chinese had moved into Tibet. Uh, I'm going further on, uh, on uh, uh, what, uh, you know, Chairman's intervention <laughs> on Tsai uh, Chin. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you've seen the parliamentary debate at that stage. Uh, Amit Shah being a politician and not a uh, diplomat, and here is the question being suddenly raised. The question is really meant for POK, okay? Um, but he, is, you know, he gets out of control and says not only that, that uh, you know, POK, in there, hum apni jaan in the yard, you know? And therefore it is very important uh, for the uh, EAM to uh, clarify the situation uh, in uh, China. But I hope, his followers in India, Amit Shah's followers in India, also understand this and don't begin to take too literally the question of giving you a chance for a side change. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is right. Uh, then he is worried that the name. Now, actually, this delinkage, the delinkage between settlement of the boundary and normalization does not begin in 93. Okay? I was personally involved. Uh, uh, yeah, that is Atal Bihari, and then he came in. The linkage is a question of our delinkage, very important. They had never a question of uh, linkage and delinkage on this issue. It was asked. Parliament in 1962 passes a resolution. That is the critical thing on the linkage, okay? You must go back to the text of that uh, link, uh, thing. So, uh, now, of course, it is true during uh, Atul Bihari, and I was on the test at that time, and then he's suddenly a little backtracks. He's a bit nervous because in terms of all our public statements, you know, we have taken this firm position of the linkage. So, and suddenly he's faced by this, by, by the parliament and by the, by the media, to be a KDI. So then he uses the phrase, a full normalization. But as far as Mrs. Gandhi was concerned, she was quite clear about the image. Quite clear. And I was the first, well, all right, I don't want to take word. It is her guidance and under her the minister and the foreign secretary, but I was the agent for negotiating with the Chinese uh, at that stage in 19, 1980. Besides date, the date that Sindai Gandhi died. Mm -hmm. so, what was the, so what were the conditions? Well, we started negotiating on normalization of trade, okay. on, uh, on cultural exchanges, etc. without going into too much on the agenda from the rooftops yeah. that this is what is going to happen. And then it continues thereafter. The, the other thing about, you know, um, 
this is a very minor thing. I think we may have, I will also go in cross check. Very minor. I think that now smile to Rajesh is me, and not October. Uh, so Garbus please check me now. Garbus is October. Forget Garbus. I will <laughs> check this. I have had a full interview with Rajesh Mishra. Okay, there's a journal called Indian Foreign Affairs Journal. And I have an oral history. And I was on the desk at that time. But once again, I might have, you no, know, my memory can fail. You may be right, Dhabar may be right, but I will not take Dhabar as my... <laughs> we, we should know a little more than Dhabar on this, but it need to be checked. I may be wrong, I may be wrong, but that's why when Srimati uh, intervened, that's right. Uh, the, the final thing, you know, on this whole... Um, uh, what I was... Uh, the, the, what I found most fascinating was your A, B, C, D uh, at the end. Uh, and I would be very grateful if you sort of a little, because right in the beginning, you spoke of opportunities. Yeah. And uh, perhaps if you can just, uh, you know, tell us a little more uh, exactly what A, B, C, D, because I think you went very fast there and I had difficulty keeping track. Thank you. Lots of very interesting very interesting uh, comments. Uh, I'll start with the ABC uh, because that was also very important. I took too much time going through 100 and God knows how many years of history. Mm -hmm. to so the idea is, is, is this, just to kind of fix, fix ideas. So what you have here, as I define strategies of linkages and linkages. Linkage means you link across issue areas. Or if an issue area has sub areas, you link across them. Sub uh, areas in this case for the law dispute is quite clear, it's the Eastern and Western Center. Right? So the strategy there is that do you link or do you take it? That's one. Within or across uh, In a very stylized representation, in a very abstract representation, essentially the way I see it is that you have the border, uh, the boundary uh, uh, dispute or, or, or the settlement question. And then you have the cooperation across other areas. The way I've depicted it, if you look at the picture that I've drawn, it's very deliberate. Because they have been there perpetuated to each other, which has been the delinquent strategy, as, as I claim that uh, Wong Wa was doing, and you said Mrs. Gandhi was also very interested. Right? So they're perpendicular for the same time. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that. China has, for the longest time, linked A and B, Oxygen Mumbai. First, in two instances, uh, where uh, you know concessions on Oxygen left meant uh, gains on McMahon line and out the line. And it has also pursued a strategy of deal linkage across economic and political spheres. So that's the that's a setup just to just to so the question I'm trying to ask with, with this abstract framework is this. Can you make, for example, can India make some combination of, of linkages and delinkages simultaneously to obtain concessions along the boundary dispute. So one concrete example I gave is that can India link D, which is political security cooperation, excluding the boundary issue. Can India make some concessions to China in B, along with firming up on A, which to my mind, sir, it is, it is yes, it is an old claim, on, on Aksai Chen, but this was a very, very uh, hardly articulated uh, uh, reiteration of our report. So could, between that on A and political security convergence on D, right, could we obtain concessions on B? That is one question that, that because to my mind that is, that is an opportunity. Let me just to sort of flesh this out, and I've written about this a couple of weeks ago. If you look at India's position on the South China Sea in the last few months, there has been a shift. I don't know how many people have, uh, are noticing this shift, but there is a shift. And I'll give you a few instances of why there is a shift. First of all, in March this year, India goes and quietly pulls out on Block 128 with Vietnam, which is on the contested water between uh, ONGC Videsh, does Petro Vietnam, doesn't we are not interested in 128, too much risk, I believe is the term that was used. Can you trade it for another block? 
I think it's, yes, there is political risk in the economic sense of the term, but I think there was some political guidance on this issue as well. If you look at our position, oh, nothing in that. Or, or, or maybe there was actually no oil, but that could also be the case. But, but let me give you some, some other examples of this. <clears throat> if you look at the Bangkok Quad statement, and if you compare the readouts between the Indian readout of that meeting and the American readout of that meeting, see, it is different in one crucial way. Freedom of navigation and mode of flight, as a phrase is taken out from the meeting. Very interesting, because in the 2 plus 2 meeting that happens in December last year, that is, that is part, that is very much there in, in the 2 plus 2 readout, but suddenly this goes. So there are a few other things, and of course, India's silence on what is going on in Bangkok. I know for a fact that Vietnam wanted us to make a statement, which we didn't. What is going on in South China Sea and the Vanguard. Van what is that? Oh, sorry, Vanguard. That, that, that problem that is going on. Because India is silent. So there is a shift. There is a, a shift is too strong a word. There is a softening of, of, of India's position. So between that, which to my mind is D, which is where political security convergence on certain issues, that has happened. A, you know, we have strengthened our claims, or we have reiterated our claims. Could all of this act together so that some progress can be made in the next round of SR talks from a sector uh, approach to the So these are the kind of, so you can think of many other combinations. I'm just giving, illustrating the interest of time, just giving one example, but, but this, this would require a, a little bit more fleshing, uh, fleshing up. Um, Sir, so about Garber being wrong, very likely, I have found a couple of mistakes about it in Garber's work. So, 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 so I, I think that... And there were some of the fundamental points which he makes in what you call his class at work, refracted. And he makes sort of, sort of, you know, some completely, you know, funny statements which have not been borne out by his people. I don't want to go into it. That's right. No, I have reviewed his book at length, but that's a different story. That's right. He has a, his new book is also pretty good. Um, well, maybe you won't like it. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, of Pradesh Mishra, the Deepen Fridge hotels is there. Amit Shah and, and, and Aksar Chin, I agree on that point, but there was a, there was a sense that he got carried away mm -hmm. and was live watching that like everybody else. And that was Adil Rajit Chaudhary say something fairly silly, and then he reacts. Mm -hmm. Here is a hypothetical question, and I think this is for all of you. Uh, imagine a world where Amit Shah just said, P.O.K. 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 will jaan de de. Oxygen was not used. Would MOFA have issued a statement that very evening about this? So, pro 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 probably no, not. My, my own sense is probably not, no, because, because this was a direct... Because uh, <coughs> my sense is that you know, they, they sense that they are going soft in China by doing hard to Pakistan. So here we are actually raising our stakes. That, that's, that's right. And, and the final remark, just, just to answer your question. So, yes, and I'm not saying this, I say it right in the beginning, there is nothing new as long as the map of India to us looks the way it looks, our claims from everywhere stand. But the fact of the matter is that we have to understand that any reasonable solution to the LSC will involve, and this is unfortunate, but will involve concessions on Accession. Accession. It's well known, frankly. This is no longer, it's not an issue. Well, the issue is that, oh, sorry, I don't want to. No, if, if you accept the McCartney McCartney line, you have a concession and it's doable. But if your question is still open. It's a sensible thing to do. Because my issue. Because, because my, 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 reading, my reading of, of again of some of, some of the writings by some of the formats has been that the technical issue, and I think Shri Shankar Manan mentions this in his book, that the technical issue of, of, of fixing this problem was resolved already some time ago. I find that uh, it's a little surprising because it's clearly it's, it's still there, so maybe it's a question of political will. But the point is that, and Another reading is that this will be some kind of a status quo plus for me. I don't know what that exactly will take. I suspect that it will entail giving China giving up claims on their job, for example. Some, some, some claims on? Some, yeah, the, the, their jobs. Yes. Not, not directly, not saying but just But, uh, the, 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 but yeah, I mean, I mean that is all the questions still open. 
Mr. Chairman, I was in China very recently, and I made a presentation there. They were not so much interested in the border question, but they wanted me to speak on India-China relations in the international community. If they did that, I have a paper, and the paper was sent to you. Have you received it? You have received it. Yes? You have received my paper. Now, we have a very distinguished writer on Kashmir, David Devadas. I asked him to join us here today because he is interested in the discussion. Why not ask him to bring his books? Ask him to speak for us. David? No, I am here to listen. No, no. Thank you very much. I am an writer and uh, several books on Kashmir, but a remarkable person. So I thought you asked him to come with us. So he has come and David, why don't you come and speak for a few minutes about your work? Or on, on, on this issue. Yes, on this issue. Our subject is actually China. Yeah. 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 Any, any other comments, questions from the that side of the room? Yes, yes. Yeah, please. I think it's a very complicated thing. Sir, I, I don't think they can hear you at no, the moment. You have to speak a little louder and just. Maybe you can cross the hearing for you. I don't think it's a very paradoxical of this situation condition. But can you highlight something more a little bit about saving and buying of Kashmir? Well, that's the seventh time. Yes, sure. So, so this happens because two two things happen. As I said, that in early March, 1846, you have uh, the first Anglo-Sikh war, so between the whole state of the British. The Sikhs of the whole state is defeated, and transfer of Jammu and Kashmir is passed to the British. Incidentally, the actual treaty, so that is the Treaty uh, of Lahore. That is the Treaty of Lahore that is, that, 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 that is signed, and it is actually, that, so that, that is control that passes. Then, seven days later, around, around the 18th of March, then that princely state of Jammu and Kashmir is sold to the Maharaja of Jammu, who is a Hindu, who is a Dogra. So it goes from Sikhs who control it, they defeat it, control passes to the British. Perhaps if you would allow, may I say something on this? John, David, you stand up. You are quite right that this happened after the uh, Battle of Sobrao, but there was no state of Jammu and Kashmir yes. until then. So yes, there was nothing to pass on. It was created through the Treaty of Amritsar, which followed the Treaty of Lahore a few days later. During the Battle of Subram, or before that, the Sikhs had made the Raja of Jammu their Prime Minister, Gulab Singh. But he stayed away from the battle along with his troops. And it is uh, presumed that he was already in touch with the British. So after they had ceded uh, victory to the British, the, the, the Sikhs, this new treaty came up, the Treaty of Amritsar, through which the state of Jammu and Kashmir was created.